Welcome back to the Warbird Mistress, and this episode's a little different. Now, every week or every other week, I post the news maps that were published by uh, the Army during the course of the war, and uh, it was actually by the Army Orientation Course, which was uh, handed out as a kind of what's going on in the world uh, for men in the armed forces. Never actually been quite sure about to whom it exactly was distributed or for what ranks or services, but... They're very interesting in seeing how the war was going on and also seeing what we were not telling people. And as important as it is to maintain certain levels of secrecy, both within the armed forces and without, it's also interesting to look back and see what the perception of war was at the time. And in this case, we look at the reverse side of one of these news maps, where the entire thing is dedicated to this article. There is and as I go through the poster, I'm also going to make a little commentary here and there because the photographs that they show are also notably interesting. And some of the comments they make, especially for something being put out in the fall of 1942, are not quite what you would think uh, would be accurate. But it's also what they're willing to make known and what they're also keeping close to the vest. So just the introduction, since there is a lot of text, I'm going to be reading each one, by the way. For the United States, the requirements of this war are extremely varied. Our airplanes are in daily operation against the enemy on many fronts, with variations in climates and battle stations that are the severest possible test of military aircraft. In the Aleutians, they are operating over water and mountains and cold and forbidding weather against Japanese establishments and aircraft. In the Solomons, operations are in stifling heat and drenching rains. In the desert, a complicating factor is swirling sand. In Australia and New Guinea, our aircraft in a single day may fly from subtropical temperatures to the chill of early spring. Operations continue in these areas and in Europe, India, China, the Central Pacific, the Caribbean, and the Atlantic. It is proof of the soundness of United States design and the versatility of the American crews that they carry on under conditions more varied and difficult than many machines ha ever have met before. Some planes know in action have recognized efficiencies even within the purposes for which they were designed. Other American aircraft have proved excellent in every theater in which they have been employed. No military aircraft is perfect, even for its design specialty. The measure of excellence is the score of the showing against the enemy. The goal towards which the United States and all the other warring powers are aimed is a balanced air force. To compare this with a balanced ground army is appropriate. No campaign in this specialized war has been won by tanks alone or by any other arm alone. Victory goes to the side with the best balance for a given situation. No war in the air will be won with an air force concentrating on the fighter, the bomber, or any other craft. It requires fighters of various types capable of operating with maximum effectiveness through all the levels of air operation, such as short-range, fast-climbing interceptors for defense against enemy bombers, or long-range, heavily-armed slugger types for the protection of one's own bombers. The complete air force needs bombers to carry out each of the specialties of that class. It needs dive bombers for attack on enemy surface craft and for cooperation with ground forces. It requires torpedo planes for attacks on enemy shipping and warcraft. It calls for long-range reconnaissance craft, for light and medium bombers capable of a variety of work, especially low-altitude trapping. It needs transports for its service operations, aircraft for taking and developing pictures of enemy targets, and planes for coastal patrol and offshore operation against enemy shipping. No nation ever has attained a perfectly balanced air power. In their combined air squadrons, the United Nations are close to the goal. These photos show some of the leading American planes that have, or are about to see, major action. I think it's important here that we look at, at how they're describing it, this, this balance that includes long-range, heavily armed slugger types for escort fighters, when in reality we'd see that we had more nimble aircraft uh, that were also equipped for long-range, rather than just a, a large kind of heavy fighter, which is definitely a pre-war idea. A short-range, fast-climbing interceptor is something that has never really changed. You've had those since, really, the beginning of aerial combat. Uh, we still have it today. So, But as for how they viewed escort fighting is, is interesting. We'll touch on that later because I noticed a few things in this that 
show more of a pre-war approach to military aviation and the strategic design elements that go into building uh, the perfect Air Force. So we'll start over with, uh, I'm going to go clockwise. Our heavy army bombers in their categories have proven superior in all theaters. They are high-altitude, long-range planes designed for precision destruction of restricted targets. They are not in the same category with the British four-motored Lancaster bomber, which was designed for night bombing and which carries much heavier bomb loads at lower altitude and slower speeds. Each type has its specialties. The B-17 and B-24 have also served as transports. The four-engine Boeing B-17E is the well-known Flying Fortress. In action all around the world, it has carried out its bombing missions, often without fighter escort, because it is so well-armed. Designed for high-altitude day bombing, it can convert to carry heavier loads at lower altitude and shorter range for night bombing. Well, there you have that. I mentioned before that we have a lot of pre-war notions of uh, aerial warfare there, and the unescorted heavy bomber is definitely one of them. The you know, the B-17 was thought to be able to infiltrate daylight airspace without escort and return because of its... And, and I'm not going to say it wasn't. It was heavily armed, but because of its heavy armament. And uh, as for high altitude, well, high altitude for 1942, sure. Um... But definitely something that may be morale boosting to read that, you know, it doesn't need these escorts, but anyone in a bomber squadron would probably look at that twice and wonder who wrote it. The consolidated B-24 Liberator performs like the Flying Fortress at high altitudes and great range. Like the B-17, it has seen action in the Pacific, North Africa, Europe, and the Aleutians. Recently, both were used together over Western Europe, and with their excellent armament, knocked out many Nazi Focke-Wulf fighters. Well, this is interesting in two ways. One, the Messerschmitt was kind of thought of as the premier fighter uh, in the public mind. So, you know, the Focke-Wulf is an interesting aircraft to mention. As for knocking out many of the Focke-Wulf fighters, well, you're not going to say how many you lost in order to take down that many, but it does say, though, that but I'm not going to say that it's a lie to say that the American bombers were certainly better protected than British bombers and and were more likely to be able to survive and defend themselves than basically the bombers of any other nation. But it is interesting, though, I notice that they don't show that the B-24 has a heavier armament, a uh, longer range. You know, really, the B-17, when you look at it, is towards the lower end of heavy bombers. And the B-24 is basically the definition of a heavy bomber. And moving down the right-hand side, we have medium and light bombers. Our medium bombers are characterized by speed, long range, and good load characteristics. They have been used for patrol and in some cases as heavy fighters, as well as for lightning bombing missions. Our dive bomber, the Douglas Dauntless, used by the Navy from carriers and by the Army as the A-24, is the best in its category. It may find its equal or superior in the German latest Dornier and Jungers, and will soon be supplemented by a newer design now in production. So whether or not the Dauntless is really the best, uh, probably up for historical debate, but it's definitely faster, more maneuverable, and sturdier than the uh, Stuka. I'm not even going to bother comparing it to um, Italian designs. The Skua, I guess, would be the equivalent in the RAF. Um, the Val is more comparable to the Vindicator. So maybe it is the best, but it's interesting that, you know, at this time it's, even they're admitting that it's about to be replaced. But anyway, starting at the top, they start with the B-25. The North American B-25 is nicknamed the Mitchell. This is the plane type that made the raid on Tokyo. It has performed well on several fronts and is powered by two racial air-cooled motors. Now, in 1942, the B-25 has yet to be modified into the gunships that, you know, we often think of. So, um, you know, it's really more just still a plain old medium bomber, just like the RAF kept it. But in the minds of the public for now, the type is basically famous for uh, the raid on Tokyo. Now, the Martin B-26 is uh, interesting, <laughs> especially this one. The Martin B-26 is called the Martian and it is powered by two air-cooled motors, an extremely fast medium bomber. It was used as a torpedo bomber at Midway and as tricycle landing gear. I frankly can't remember hearing of the Marauder being called the Martian, but 
if that's what it is, that's what it is. Uh, the uh, one thing I will notice, though, is that in the photograph, I can't quite tell what that is on the, the undercarriage there. To be honest, I think it's a torpedo. Um, just based on its shape, it's longer than uh, a bomb would be. The B-26 had an interior uh, bomb bay, and the fins on it make it look like one. If anybody disagrees, that's fine. It just happened to catch my eye, and uh, I'll have to check out that tail number, figure out what that was. But, you know, at least they didn't say that it also kind of failed as a torpedo bomber, but it's beside the point. The Douglas A-20 is called the Havoc by the British and the Boston by our forces. It is a light two-engine bomber widely used over Europe and Egypt. Shown here on Coastal Patrol, it also has been used as a heavy fighter. Well, there's a lot here. First off, it was the Havoc to us and the Boston to them. Um, but we'll take it for what it is. Now, its role in Europe and Egypt, of course, is a given. The A-20 is, I would say it's definitely more famous as an ETO aircraft. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't seen in the Pacific either or on anti-submarine duties. Uh, so it is interesting they have that. And as for being used as a heavy fighter, you know, it, it's interesting they put that at the end, but they don't mention that it's also a night fighter. So I'm not sure if that's because night fighter hadn't really been a role that would make it famous yet, or if they were keeping that close to the vest or they wanted to save a couple of words, but either way. And here we go. The Douglas Dauntless is used by our Army, A-24, and Navy, SBD-1, as a standard dive bomber. It is shown here with its brakes down to retard the diving speed for better aim. Well, yeah, it retards the diving speed. It also keeps the plane from shattering into pieces in a high-speed dive when it tries to get out of it. But, the, uh, you know, as they mentioned above, was it the best at the time? Likely. And its replacement, though, is where we might get a chuckle. The Curtis Wright Helldiver, Navy SB-2C-1, is a new dive bomber for the Navy and described as the best in the world. It carries its bomb load inside the fuselage. Okay, so looking back, we're not going to call the Helldiver the best dive bomber in the world. Um, <laughs> it's just not known for that. But, you know, you definitely want to make people think that what's coming up next is the best that ever has been. And, well, I guess that's the best they could do right there. As for saying it carried its bomb load inside the fuselage, it's interesting because, in a way, it kind of hides a secret. You don't know what it carries. They're not saying how fast it is. They're just saying that it's the best. And that, you know, it doesn't really give out too much about an aircraft that I doubt was really known about beyond uh, the armed forces itself. The Navy's patrol bombers are the equals of any in the world, and in range they are probably superior. Ships like the famed PBY are not built for speed, but the ability to stay long hours in the air and to land on rough water for refueling and servicing. New heavy planes, notably the new Consolidated and Martin patrol planes, are replacing it. In range and speed, and eh, to be honest, the Sunderland was definitely up there, although much, much larger. Uh, the Italian craft were definitely comparable, but all right, we'll give the uh, we'll give the Catalina her due here. The consolidated PBY five is known as the Catalina. This was a type of plane that spotted the German battleship Bismarck for the British Navy. It has tremendous range. The consolidated PB two Y three is called the Coronada. With the Catalina and the twin engine Martin Mariner PBN, it is carrying out long range patrol work. Now here it's interesting because you know, they don't really give out any details on the Catalina at all, except for tremendous range. The Catalina really was one of the prizes in the uh, American arsenal, and I'm not surprised that they don't really say much about it. As for the Coronado, it's interesting they don't mention the size because it is just, well, to be honest, you can look at it and you'd see that it's just this tremendous flying boat. But they also don't mention that it's a transport. They don't really go into details. It's just, this is the Coronado. There's two other ones, and it does long-range patrol work. And in all honesty, it's interesting they have the Coronado there because the more famous ones of the war are going to be the Catalina and the Mariner. The Coronado, to be honest, is, is forgotten about um, in many ways. So it's interesting to see it here. 
and not a bad thing. And keeping with more utilitarian aircraft, we go to the transports. Just as other plane types have served several purposes, so our heavy bombers have often operated as transports. A distinct transport type, however, is the Douglas C-47 and C-53, both of which are modified versions of our standard civil airline commercial transport, the DC-3. Several other large land and sea transports are in production and use. Well, right there you see it is, you know, heavy bombers have operated as transports. Definitely something that is more, I would say, towards RAF usage. In the RAF case, it's kind of funny that you see the, the wartime bomber become a post-war civil airliner and transport aircraft, and even during the war, transports. Whereas in the German case, you saw civil transports and mail planes become military aircraft. And the American case, you saw civil transports become bombers and transport aircraft during the war. Uh, and even before the war, you look at the, uh, the DC-2. And then after the war, you see all these military aircraft basically going on to become the backbone of the world of civil aviation. The captions here are very minimal. Um, the Douglas C-47 or C-53 is the same plane as the commercial DC-3. The C-47 is fitted inside for carrying cargo, while the C-53 has seats for airborne troops. The Curtis Commando C-46 is designed for carrying both troops and materiel, including field artillery and reconnaissance. Notice its big whale-like nose. So it is interesting that, you know, it's the same plane as the commercial DC-3. To us, that may not sound like much, but it shows a great deal about the 1940s that civil aviation in the 20s and 30s really was something that people followed. Even though very few people would have had the opportunity to fly, it was still something that people knew about. It's not like today where we say that you know something is the same as a 747. Well, we all know 747s, and a significant chunk of the population has been on one. Or on another, or on another jet airliner. This really shows the fame of the Douglas DC-3 and the dominance it had in the world of civil aviation. People knew what a DC-3 was, and the average GI or officer candidate or you know, anybody else could look at that and say that's a DC-3, and that shows in a very small way how tremendous the impact of that golden age of aviation had been on public awareness of aircraft. As for the Curtis Commando, again, it's something that people just don't think of these days. Everybody thinks of the uh, the DC-3. Um, in fact, honestly, most people think of the C-47. A lot of people forget about the uh, C-53 being the uh, airborne deployment platform. But the C-46, of course, is responsible for you know, flying the hump, for doing a lot of the heavy hauling. And it, it is, unfortunately, not in the public imagination the way it should be. An aircraft that is also not in the public imagination as it should be, and yet is, how should I put it, almost forgotten about for good reasons, is the one in uh, the caption and the first photograph of our next section. The Douglas TBD Devastator. So as we look at torpedo bombers, remember that this is well after the Battle of Midway. This is being published you know, in November of 1942. So the Devastators, or at least what was left of them, are, I think there was like one or two left in service in Florida for, I think, maybe a year or two after Midway, but that was it. I guess I'm putting the cart before the horse here, so. The Douglas Devastator was the Navy's standard torpedo bomber when we entered the war. Development already underway soon caught up with it, and it is being replaced by the Grumman Avenger, which is bigger and more powerful. The Douglas Devastator TBD-1 is a torpedo bomber designed for aircraft carrier service. The identifying feature is its broad low wing that tapers back into the fuselage. The new Grumman Avenger TBF first saw battle at Midway. It carries a torpedo inside the fuselage, or 2,000 pounds of bombs, has a top speed of more than 270 miles per hour, and a range of 1,400 miles. So yes, the Devastator has an identifying feature and its broad low wing that tapers back into the fuselage. Its other identifying feature is that it's probably at the bottom of the Coral Sea or the Central Pacific. Honestly here, I'm not sure why they're putting it out there. 
um, as a serving aircraft, but it might not have been known even within the military about how the Devastator was devastated. I'm honestly thinking that they would have not made that public for a lot of reasons, but also that the people making these might have just been given photographs and a couple of little lines of information and told to do this poster, and that was it. As for the TBF, it might not be a good idea to tell the enemy that something brand new is already in the front lines, and and it's also interesting to see that they do put the speed and range there, but at the time, 270 mile an hour for a laden torpedo bomber would have been seen as fantastic, and a range of 1,400 miles makes it seem like just the thing for anti sub ops in the Atlantic, and for striking back at the Japanese in the Pacific. So right there, it's a little bit of pride, but also, like I said, they don't really give out a lot of information here. But it's information that might be useful in keeping up morale, and also just interesting to somebody perusing it. Now, the next section is the most involved, and that's fighters. The most highly specialized combat type is probably the fighter plane. Those designed for low-altitude work lose effectiveness higher up. An engine which develops its maximum at high altitudes, i.e. above 25,000 feet, will have inferior performance at the low levels. For the complete domination, we need fighters of maximum performance at three possible levels. Sea level to 15,000 feet, 15,000 to 25,000 feet, and above 25,000 feet. Now right here it shows the pre-war vision of pursuit aircraft. Actually, to be honest, fighter aircraft. They don't call them pursuit aircraft here. The Army Air Force had decided that it needed three basic aircraft, a low-altitude fighter, a medium-altitude fighter, and a high-altitude interceptor. Now, the high-altitude interceptor, of course, became the P-38. The low-altitude plane was the Aracobra, and the medium-altitude plane was the P-40. So the idea was that you needed, you know, basically your ground pounder slash uh, low-altitude support aircraft that could take out enemy light bombers as well as any fighters patrolling. You know, kind of your continuation of the Great War Fighter. At the medium altitudes, you want a maneuverable, sturdy aircraft that's rugged, that has enough range to reach into enemy territory, as well as the capability of establishing and maintaining air superiority or air supremacy. And at high altitude and long range, you're looking at an aircraft that can intercept enemy bombers, as well as tangle with any escorts if there are any. Remember, we're still thinking pre-war when most people would think that the U.S. could only be attacked by large, long-range, unescorted bombers. In addition, you need a heavier armament. So, of course, the P-38 has a 20mm cannon. And the twin engines fits into the heavy fighter idea, so it's not that far behind the Zerstöre or the uh, British idea that you needed some sort of dedicated interceptor with a large battery of guns. Of course, they went the turret route, but I'll do a video on that another day. So, our first photo here. The Grumman Wildcat F4F3 is a Navy carrier-based fighter. It has also been used from land fields in the Southwest Pacific fighting. The same model is called the Martlet, as used by the British Navy. Above shows the plane ready for action as plane handling crews on a carrier or serve battle rations. Okay, first off, Royal Navy. Just gotta get that out there. Secondly, it is an F4F3 there. You see that the wings don't fold. There's only four machine guns. And yet, by this time of the war, the F4F4 was there with, I think it was only 240 rounds per gun. Even though there were six guns, the wings folded, but it was not as popular with pilots as was the F4F3. And interestingly, it is the only Grumman here. You're going to notice that the uh, Hellcat makes no appearance. But we do go to one of the most famous aircraft of the war, and this is interesting. The North American P-51 has been called the Mustang in Britain and has seen action over Western Europe. It is powered by the liquid-cooled Allison engine. All right, and of course, we've got the, you know, the Razorback of the ABC Mustangs there. And it's curious that, um, in fact, to be honest, I'm not sure that this picture isn't of an Apache. But anyway, 
it's not seen as an escort. It's not seen as an air superiority fighter. It's, in fact, nothing's really mentioned about it at all, just that it's seen action over Western Europe, which isn't really true at the time. It's really been seeing action uh, in North Africa. But curious enough that they don't have any sort of uh, inkling that this is going to end up being one of the aircraft that helps win the war, one of the most defining aircraft of World War II and the Korean War. Yet there she is, in at least it's in American colors, and for this point in the war, that's interesting in itself. And the next one, and I can tell you right now that this photograph is of a prototype. In fact, it's a very well-published photo. The Navy's Vought Sikorsky F4U-1 is called the Corsair. Its inverted gull wing is a recognition factor and has been called the fastest fighter in the world. So by this point in 1942, it hasn't really seen service. In fact, it's the Navy's Corsair, which, uh, let's face it, it's probably most famous as a Marine Corps aircraft, and that's not just me tooting our own horn, which we're good at. It's just a matter of, of historical fact that the Marine Corps had it in numbers way before the Navy did. It was in a way relegated to the Marine Corps, but, but in the same way that other things were given to the Marine Corps, they showed what to do with it, and then the squids asked for it back. But regardless of inter-service rivalry, what you see here is the uh, prototype of the Corsair. The cockpit is still very far forward. It's in factory metal finish, of course, but it's definitely something to watch out for. So it was known in the public by 1942, I believe, uh, if I look at some of the publications that were out at the time, it was in advertisements. It was in a couple of civilian market magazines. But, oh, again, they kept their cards close to the vest. The next aircraft is, I have to say, I don't think I've seen this one with these pre-war markings quite yet. But let's look at the caption. The Republic P-47 is called a Thunderbolt. Designed for high-altitude work, it is one of the biggest fighter planes. While it has not yet been reported in action, it is in service and production. It has greater speed than the P-38 at extreme altitudes and is powered with a radial air-cooled engine. With the P-38, it shows great promise for high-altitude work, but neither has been thoroughly tested in battle. So as I said, this is very early in the war. It has greater speed than the P-38 at extreme altitudes. Well, that's because the P-38 hadn't really been given the turbo superchargers that it needed to perform at those levels. As for being one of the biggest fighter planes, well, it basically remains, uh, where propeller aircraft are concerned, the biggest single-engine fighter. And one of the things I find most ironic here is it says designed for high-altitude work. And yet, it's really going to be the aircraft that is known to be one of the best ground pounders that's out there. I mean... There's a reason that the A-10 is the Thunderbolt too. The P-47 took the war back to the mud. It's so famous as an interdiction, anti-tank, close support aircraft that in Saving Private Ryan, when they called the P-51 a tank buster, people who knew only the bare minimum about air warfare kind of called BS on that. And they Because <laughs> even in the popular imagination, the P-47 is the aircraft that the troops on the ground wanted to see. So, but as it says here, it, it had yet to see service, according to this, and honestly, by the fall of 1942, I think it, I do think it just hadn't entered, or was just entering service. I have to look that up. Now, this aircraft, I think, is identifiable by everybody. The twin-engine Lockheed P-38 is called the Lightning. It is a high-altitude interceptor with long range and great firepower. It has seen action in the Aleutians and is powered by Allison engines. With the P-47, it is among the biggest fighter planes. Now, of course, it's a twin-engine fighter. It's going to be one of the biggest, but what gets me is when you see a P-38, it's not as big as you think it would be. In fact, it's quite small for a twin-engine twin aircraft. But it does show here the pre-war idea that it was going to be this high-altitude interceptor that could go out at long range and take out any of these land-based bombers that were perceived as a possible threat against the continental U.S. And, of course, its long range did make it a great fighter for the Pacific. That it hadn't been thoroughly tested in battle, as they call it, 
is a little inaccurate because by now in 1942, the P-38 was certainly reaching New Guinea, but that doesn't mean that it was being fully tested. And we also have to remember that the P-38 had not yet evolved. So we're not looking at a late war P-38. We're looking at the interpretations of a pre-war P-38. And so you only have that scope to look at. We have hindsight. They don't. Now one aircraft here that I mean, I've done my video on, it's, I've actually, I'm flattered that it has been called the best P-40 video by people who have museums full of P-40s. Um, so I'm going to hold my tongue and just read the caption first. The Curtis P-40 has gone through six major type changes from P-40A to P-40F. Types now in wide use are the E, Kitty Hawk, and F, Warhawk. Powered with the Allison engine, it has heavy hitting power, excellent armor, and is a good medium-level fighter. It is a veteran, having seen action on every fighting front, and in North Africa has even been used as a light bomber. This is the plane used in China by the Flying Tigers. So there's a lot going on here. First off, Kitty Hawk was not a name used by the United States Army Air Forces. And the Kitty Hawk versus War Hawk versus Tomahawk, it, well, I have two whole videos on that. If you haven't seen the long one, it's worth it. I have to say it's one of my most popular videos. If you haven't seen the short one, that one is surprisingly not that popular, but it's just a quick run-through of the versions of the P-40. I'm going to add a card here so you can click on that. As for the uh, six major type changes, yeah, I mean, you're really looking at several small ones, but okay, in other words, there's six variants. That's fine. It was a veteran fighter, and yet they still see it as a medium-level fighter. Which, by this point in the war, it was clear that it was better off at low altitudes and as a support fighter in the ETO. And in the Pacific, it was definitely something that required altitude to get the jump on zeros, but it was also an aircraft that was being taxed by the demands of the war. And finally, the, this is the plane used by the Flying Tigers. Uh, the ABG was definitely a darling of the American press. People would have known about it. Uh, there were not only just newsreels, but I mean, you're looking that, heck, John Wayne made a movie about it. In the fall of 1942, you had to pick your victories, and the Flying Tigers were known as this group of Americans that had victories over the Japanese, and you may as well reinforce that image. Even if the actual markings of the aircraft in there are pre-war, and it looks like the teeth that are there are actually just added by someone retouching the photograph because it doesn't look anything like any of the nose art that was typical of a P-40. It looks like somebody was just shown to draw a triangle with a bunch of triangle teeth. Not that I'm criticizing the drawing skills of a six-year-old, but that's what it looks like, and pretty sure that you know, especially being in pre-war colors, you never would have seen that on that P-40. That's definitely been a retouched photo. Whereas in the next photo, we even see the squadron insignia. Um, I'm definitely going to have to look up which that is, but I know it looks darn familiar. The Bell Air Cobra P-39 has performance characteristics similar to the P-40. Its Allison engine is placed behind the pilot's cockpit, and its heavy nose cannon makes it excellent for strapping. His tricycle landing gear is good on rough emergency airfields. Well, that last part is true. I mean, I don't think that the P-39 would have been half as influential if it wasn't rugged enough and sturdy enough to deal with the unprepared airstrips that were all around Port Moresby in the New Guinea campaign. As for performance characteristics like the P-40, well, I'm sure there's a lot of documentaries on the P-39 out there and she has her fans. To be honest, I actually love the P-39. Um, well, the Air Cobra and the King Cobra are you know, two of my favorite aircraft. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to say that it has the performance characteristics of a P-40. It does show, of course, that the Allison engine is behind the pilot's cockpit. It talks about the heavy nose cannon. Um, doesn't mention that the 37mm was almost useless, but but it's definitely something that makes it noteworthy and, you know, probably this is the clearest and best description of a P-39 that you could really have at the time. The P-40 may be famous, the P-40 may be almost a trademark of the war, but 
to ignore the P-39 and its abilities and performance would be a, a great disservice to the Army Air Forces, especially in 1942. But that's where we are, and, you know, definitely welcome comments and, you know, your, your toppings about what's in this particular poster. I think that it's a great little snapshot of what people were being told about the air war, what America's perception of herself in terms of air warfare and air strategy was, how so many of those pre-war ideas had yet to die out, especially with heavy bombers and fighters. And it's just a kind of a neat little snapshot of the American arsenal. Now, granted, there are plenty of aircraft that are missing in there. There's no Hellcat, even though the Hellcat was definitely in development then. None of the foreign types are shown here. It doesn't show American Spitfires, Mosquitoes, although those are kind of a footnote even to modern-day readers. It doesn't really show any, many of the naval aircraft. You know, there, there's no duck in there. There's no, uh, you know, no Curtis seaplanes at all. The Vindicator is interestingly missing completely, even though the Vindicator was still in service in 1942. The Vindicator is missing completely, even though it was still in service in 1942. Uh, the SBC Helldiver, of course, the, my first video, uh, that's not mentioned, but it also might be a way of saying that they want to move forward. The Devastator was still a torpedo bomber that people thought of, even though it was very dated by now. Any sailor on any carrier or naval air station that would have seen the Devastator listed there would have said we're still using that, but it shows it in comparison to the Avenger, which is a good thing. And of course it mentions things like the Flying Tigers, the Raid on Tokyo. It's doing its job to raise morale in ways that are very subtle, and informing people about what America has in terms of advanced weaponry. And with that, we'll stop here. I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, I look forward to your comments and everything else. I hope everybody had a great American Thanksgiving yesterday. And I will see you in the next video. Until then, this is Claire, and I am the Warbird Mistress. Take care.